with uh, some examples about how to use 3D for the for the aortic valve and uh, scenarios where we actually do uh, tabbies, which I think it's uh, it's actually a, a good way to actually get introduced. As I mentioned before, I don't have any disclosures here. And again, I think at that point, we have uh, actually been uh, really, really involved in how to orient ourselves. So for these specific uh, clinical cases, I think to get the right, uh, the right uh, CASP is very important to orient ourselves. Again, uh, you have the models, you can use the web page, as we mentioned you before, but I think this is what I have in my brain every single time that I'm doing uh, transesophageal echo, okay? So in the short axis view of the aortic valve, again, we are going to have the non-coronary cusp, which is always the reference between the interatrial septum, okay? The left and the right, and that's how we are actually going to orient ourselves compared to those structures here, okay? So if we go to the long axis, what we are going to be able to see, and that's what I always tell everyone. So we have this cap here that everyone knows what it is now at that point. The right. What about this one? <laughs> it's difficult, no? And th that's when the, the things come in, no? Between the known and the left, what I can tell you is you increase your angle up to 140, you have higher chance to actually pick the left. If you decrease a little bit your angle to 110, so you most likely will actually get the known. So 110. So we are like that, and then we are increasing to 120, so a little bit decrease non-coronary, and a little bit increase the left. That's another way to actually try to get the, the views, okay? So that's the first example, and I wanted to point that out. <coughs> we, we consistently uh, talk about that you need to add something that will help you. So what I will normally do is I will take a bigger uh, box sample to orient myself, put it when I like it and the presentation that I liked it, and then I will crop it <coughs> and then mark the structures, even on the 3D data set. So you can actually, when you go back in, because you can see the interatrial septum here, but you need to know that you are there, okay? So for that, you need to be able to actually see the rest of the uh, structures. And that's the 2D picture. This is an example of a bicuspid ca uh, cusp with a raffi in between the left and the, and the right, okay? So we have it uh, actually over there. So the same thing with, uh, with uh, 3D, okay? So another thing that I would like to point is uh, the fact of the LVOT diameter, okay? We always assess aortic stenosis. Uh, when we are in the OR, we are under anesthesia conditions. So <coughs> the flow can actually be very variable. So one of the things that you can definitely do, and based on the findings that the LVOT is actually not circular, is actually elliptic, you can really take a 3D picture of the, of the LBOT track. And as an example, here the LBOT diameter <coughs> by 2D, again, it's difficult. Sometimes the aortic valve is very calcified. So it's 2.3, and we got an aortic valve area of 1.3, no? So in this same example, we go to the picture that we did before. Uh, this is a Phillips uh, example. You go to multiplane reconstruction. You are very sure that you are cutting exactly where you have your structure. You're happy with all the images, you align your planes, okay, and you want to bring it to the LBOT diameter, okay? So you go there and you can actually measure two things. You can get your diameter, which in this case, it can be uh, seen very well here, but it's 2.02, .02, which is a little bit of a difference. Or you can even get the area and it's your cross-section and area, <coughs> area calculation, you can actually use it. And it's going to be actually more accurate even, but the diameter is going to change too. So if you use those calculations with 3D, your area is really 0.8, okay? So it's just another point uh, that is actually important when we are using that technology, okay? So our tech insufficiency, so I normally go to the long axis. I try to optimize my image. I have said that before in the hands-on. I always try to go to, for example, if we are using Philips uh, HBR, okay, the high volume rate. You try to mobilize when you're happy with the image that you are getting. You stop the vent. <coughs> you try to gate as much as you can to get the best uh, resolution for your image. Uh, after that, you can actually crop it and then to show the image that you want. With that, <coughs> what can we do? 
So this is an example. For example, uh, we were able to calculate by PISA the effective regurgitant orifice. So one thing that we can do with 3D is you can go there, go to multiplane reconstruction, freeze the, freeze the image, and get this window here. So long axis of the aortic valve, short axis. As you can see, I'm narrowing the sector to get the maximum frame rate. And then here, which is actually seen from, uh, from, uh, from above, so you can actually have your effective regurgitant orifice area. And you can, calc you can multiply that by your BTI on your uh, mitral regurgitant jet and get an estimation on how much is your uh, regurgitant volume. Okay, and then you can compare one and the other, which is another thing that you can definitely use that technology for, okay? So I wanted to put an example of uh, hypertrophic obstructive chiliodoma myopathy. So this is a, an image of there. The other thing is how to measure, for example, the interventricular septum. So you know exactly where you are cutting the septum. And then I think it's actually good to, because sometimes you can see when you have this uh, LBOT acceleration flow, how, so that's the image that we are getting. So that's not the way that we are supposed to actually s looking at, no? So we change it, and then that's the view from the surgeon. So the surgeon, as Max mentioned, is going to pull from the right coronary cusp, is going to go down, and is going to do the, the septal myectomy over there. And that's the view that he's actually going to have, the opposite that we were actually having there, <coughs> no? So, one of the other things that we can do is before the myectomy, you can actually estimate your smaller, like the, the minimal area, the minimal area of the LBOT diameter. You can do it by 3D, choose trace, you get the measurement, you know pre myectomy and after myectomy, you measure from the annulus up to the minimal area. What was the distance? You apply the same distance here and then you measure it again and you can tell the surgeon your valve area went from 2.5 to 3.05, which is another way of actually telling him that the myectomy is good, it's opening, there is no lamina flow, but you can give him an objective measurement on the LVOT area. The minimal LVOT area is actually increased, but at least uh, 0.5 centimeters, okay? Which is pretty good, on top of doing the gradients. So I apologize for that, but that's happening since I updated the system too. So. The first case for Tavar, I think uh, I always will recommend uh, to go with the X plane because it gives you a lot of information in <laughs> both planes. So I just wanted to put an example here of uh, an, aortic, uh, an aortic stenosis that was actually going with a Tavar with a little finding in the TE echo that was uh, uh, actually pretty interesting. So this case, what the cardiologist saw, we give uh, a little annular plane, and again, you can do it in 2D, or you can go to 3D, know exactly where you are, and give a full area, and you give them what's the full area, okay? You go to X plane, and you can actually see both the structures in both planes, which I think it's really, really uh, important for us when we are doing that. And then what happened here is uh, they, before deploying the, the tower, they actually normally do like a, a, a little valvuloplasty. And after the valvuloplasty, what we were able to see is that flap here, which I saw there. So again, if you want to know there what's involved, you really don't know. So you go to your X plane, you cut there, and you can certainly see that there was a little dissection of the <laughs> non coronary cusp with the balloon uh, uh, dilatation, okay? So what they did is they decided to go ahead and deploy the sapiens valve. And after the sapiens valve was actually deployed, they were able to actually fix that just with the, with the valve. And there was no residual, which I think is uh, another uh, good example on how to assess those, uh, those things. So this is another case. So this one was like a very long day, an extremely long day in the UR. So uh, we have a patient that has a previous uh, 
so that, that came to actually get a, a, a tower for an aortic stenosis. So they tried to actually deploy a core valve. And as you can see, the shape of the core valve is completely different from the Sapiens. Those are the main valves that we actually use here, Sapiens 3 and the core valve. And the core valve, <coughs> the head should be situated in between the annulus, and this should actually go up. So we don't occlude the coronaries. The only difference, basically, with the Sapiens and with this one, this one tends to embolize a little bit more. And the other one tends to actually occlude a little bit more the coronaries when we actually deploy them, OK? So in this situation, the problem that we have is this after the deployment, what do you think is happening here? So the, the, the valve migrated a little bit higher than it's supposed to be. As you can see in the image, this part here should, sh this part here should be actually at this level. And then the crown should actually start here and not over there. So really with that, we, we can't really do anything. So what they decide to do is go with the sapiens, deploy the valve in the annulus, and try to actually fish the core back the core uh, valve uh, down. And we try for several, several hours. Uh, the problem that we got is that, OK, when we were trying to fish in and out, in and out, in and out, so at the end, on the descending aorta, uh, we get like a, a little flap. We get like a distal dissection was not a happy day. We were not, never able to actually fish the valve, and we ended up requiring to do a thoracotomy for rescue that uh, valve in. But again, uh, this explain uh, for these uh, cases, I think it's, it's one of the, the best things to have, because you, you can, at the same time that things are happening, you can orient yourself in two planes, and, and you are giving real information in real time to the, to the surgeons, OK? Any questions?